some of the pictures you'll see in this film were taken by fire department photographers, and they are somewhat gruesome, but they're also puzzling. For instance, there was no evidence of gasoline or other substances being used to burn the victims to death. This is a story about a phenomenon that defies all the known laws of science. Rosie. If it happens at all, it usually happens like this, unexpectedly, when the victim is alone. <laughs> it can take only a matter of minutes, and when the flames die down, there is a pile of oily ash from which comes a sweet-smelling odor. But there is always something left to bury. Is it a freak of nature? The mythology can be traced back to biblical times when the prophet Elijah showed the power of his God by pouring barrels of water four times over a sacrifice and around the altar. Then, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. It was a pretty satisfying demonstration. And in the 19th century, many writers, such as Charles Dickens, used this strange force to dispose of evil characters. In Bleak House, Mr. Guppy and Mr. Weevil found this, all that remained of the rag and bottle merchant, Jacob Crook. Some of his readers thought he was cheating, but Dickens defended himself, citing medical reports going back 200 years. And in the modern-day press, reports appear of mysterious deaths by fire. Sometimes they're called suicides or accidents. Mostly, it's death by burning. Cause unknown. In the annals of spontaneous human combustion, no victim has been more thoroughly investigated than Mary Reeser, whose remains lie here in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. She was a 67-year-old widow, living alone when she went up in smoke in 1951. And all that remained of her was a charred liver, a shrunken skull, and a foot, still wearing a black satin slipper. Not far from the grave site lived Larry Arnold, who's fascinated by the Reeser case and others like it. By training, he's a mechanical engineer. But 10 years ago, he set up an organization called Parascience International, a small network of people who investigate weird subjects. Arnold says he's recorded nearly 300 cases of self-combustion. Yes, as difficult as it is for the medical community to believe the human body can self-combust just like that. How do you get people to believe you, Larry? We're talking about the research that we do, and quite simply, we show them the photograph. In preparation for a book he's writing, Arnold has collected pictures of victims like Mary Reeser, a landmark case. The FBI in Washington examined the remains and could find no explanation. What could explain such an intense fire that barely damaged the apartment? Even more bewildering. How could a woman weighing 170 pounds be reduced to less than 10 pounds of ash, including the armchair? What, what is this here? That is interpreted as her skull by some researchers, and if indeed that is her head, then it shrank to the size of a grapefruit, which medically is impossible, and yet the documentation from the days in which the case was investigated does state that her skull shrank to the size of a grapefruit or an orange. Well, who's this? Who's, what does this belong to? This is Dr. John Irving Bentley. And on a December morning in 1966, this is his legacy to the world. One half of one leg, everything else was reduced to a pile of ash about five inches high, 14 inches in diameter, which had burned through the hole in his bathroom floor and was found on the earthen floor in the basement beneath. Yet his aluminum walker, which was directly above the most intense point of combustion failed to melt, as did the rubber tips on its legs. What about these? Who, whose legs do these belong to? This is the remains of Mrs. C. 
two in a fall morning in 1964 in Pennsylvania. Left two legs pop up against the front of the chair. The rest of the body, as you can see, is basically non-existent. The fascinating aspect in that particular case is that from the time the victim was last spoken to until the fire department arrived and photographs were taken, only some 10 minutes had elapsed. Yet in a crematorium to ash in a body, and indeed in a crematorium a body is not really ash and it's just reduced to bone matrix, temperatures of 2200 degrees Fahrenheit for at least an hour and a half were required to achieve similar destruction. And only at temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 hours can the skeleton of the human body actually be ashen. What is all this on the wall and the stuff dripping down here? This is some varnish from the picture frame. Obviously, there was enough heat to liquefy the varnish in the frame, which ran down. This is certain discoloration and, and some minor blistering of the paint on the wall behind the chair. The telephone here is melted slightly. The lampshade um, had fallen off, and there's some minor charring at the edge of the table. Um, but aside from that, the carpeting under the chair is intact. Her legs, the skin is superficially blistered, but otherwise intact and, and relatively undamaged. Yep. Yet in her torso, from the knees up, is completely ashen. Um, I noticed the bell in the... The brass bell, yes, she was an invalid, and she used the brass bell to summon assistance. And the brass bell did not melt, indicating that the temperature in the lap of the victim could not have been very great. So once again, we're confronted with the paradox of tremendous destruction, but not a great deal of attendant heat. Dublin, where in 1970 there was a mysterious house fire. So mysterious that the fire department asked for the city coroner to come to the scene. The coroner is Dr. Patrick Bofin, a professor of forensic medicine at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. He says the case has haunted him for more than 15 years because he could find no logical reason why an elderly woman who lived in the house had been burned to ashes. What I'm saying is that forensic pathologists uh, look for uh, look for an extraneous cause of ignition. Uh, they do not accept the term spontaneous combustion. No scientist can. But um, the unfortunate thing about it is that I've seen only one case. I saw it when I was unprepared. Uh, the next coroner who sees a case will also see his case unprepared. And that we don't, we see so few that there, there is not adequate material for sensible, proper, disciplined research into it. Now, may I show you some slides of these pictures? Uh, Dr. Bofin sometimes shows these slides during his lectures to medical students. He took the pictures with his own camera. Uh, first slide, um, we, see, we see there's uh, an overall view of what I saw uh, that particular day. Of the lady, uh, uh, all that remains is what we see here and here. That is the her feet uh, with a small amount of adjacent uh, shin covered uh, with stocking. The only other object burnt is just one leg of the small chair which one sees. Uh, in the picture, the clothing, the bed clothing on the adjacent bed is totally undamaged uh, and not even squashed. Now the heat generated uh, must have been considerable. Although the room is a, was a small room, uh, nothing has been damaged uh, except at a distance of about nine feet from the ladies' chair, uh, the television set which we can see in this picture here. And in this, you, you can see heat damage to the front of the television set where it has melted. Uh, but there is heat damage, no flame damage. In the south of London, retired fire chief Jack Stacy strolls through his neighborhood cemetery and reflects on the strangest case of his 30-year career. He and his men were called to a derelict house where there was a flickering light. They found a dead man. When we entered the building, he was lying on the bottom of the stairs, uh, half turned onto his left side. And he had obviously died in great pain because he was biting the nail post, which was made of solid mahogany. 
and his knees were drawn up as though he was trying to bend the pan from his stomach. And there was about a four-inch um, slit in his stomach, just about at this point. And the flame was emanating from that four-inch slit, like a blowtorch. It was a blue flame, which would indicate spirit. The flame was actually coming from the body itself, from inside the body. He was burning literally from the inside out. And it was definitely under pressure. And it was impinging onto the timber flooring below the body. So much so that the heat from the flame was charring the woodwork. When we put the fire out and then we continued to investigate the cause of it, we found that there were at least two of the three elements that are required to maintain a fire. That is fuel, oxygen, and a heat source. We had the fuel, which was obviously spirit of some kind, but we didn't have oxygen, and we didn't have a heat source inside the body. And that fire was coming from the body. It didn't start outside, it started inside. The heat was unbearable. Where? <laughs> From the old TV series, Barney Miller, the cops have another tough night ahead with a human fireball. My skin was starting to crackle. Yeah, we've heard it all before. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm a combustible. I could self-incinerate at any moment. <laughs> really? Sounds like SHC. Spontaneous human combustion. Oh, that again. <laughs> This man doesn't think it's funny, because he is a combustible. At least that's what he believes after some unsettling experiences. His name is Jonathan Carr, and he works at a major library in Washington, D.C. His boss has advised him to stay out of the rare book section. He's come to the home of Larry Arnold in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to tell his story. You told us you had a burning sensation. Yes, I did. Uh, just below the area of my heart, uh, a three by four inch area. And that the size of your palm? Yes. was a bright crimson. Uh, was starting to bubble, the blister, and uh, began uh, the day of my brother's wedding. Halfway through the ceremony, I thought I was catching fire. Uh, that's how intense this and pain was. He certainly is not a classic case of spontaneous combustion where there is severe physiological damage done to the body by a flame-like process. Given that Jonathan's injuries were not very severe, was he taken seriously? Unfortunately, he wasn't by the physicians who attended him. In fact, several of them laughed at his claims of having been burned internally. Um, unfortunately, that happens in many cases. One case where it did not happen involved Jack Angel, another survivor of much more severe spontaneous combustion than was Jonathan. In 1974, Jack Angel awoke from a sleep that lasted four days to discover that one of his hands had been burned to black from the inside out, and he had other types of burn wounds on his chest and his groin on his back. He was attended by physicians who diagnosed the burns as second and third degree internal in origin. So did the doctors actually say this was spontaneous human combustion? They haven't taken the last step to say that it's spontaneous combustion, although one of the physicians whom we interviewed did acknowledge that he could come up with no other rational explanation. I can't see how it could possibly happen on the basis of physics and chemistry. For it takes a great, great deal of heat to burn a whole human body. Dr. Lester Adelson is a coroner in Cleveland, Ohio. When he was a fellow at Harvard Medical School, he researched a paper on spontaneous combustion. He'd never seen a case, and he's sure he never will. So we have to go and now say, what really happened? Presumption is not proof, conjecture is not evidence, analogy is not always a good way to reason, and hunches have no place in his business. You're going to play hunches. You're going to have nothing but frustration. Dr. Adelson, because you have no scientific explanation for this, does it mean that it doesn't happen? In my op opinion, and it is an opinion, yes, I cannot, for instance, rationalize on this picture here where you have two intact 
sides, legs, and feet, and the arms and everything else are completely gone. These things haven't even been warmed up. They're not even, looks like they were exposed to any kind of heat, and within a matter of an inch or two, it's completely charred and destroyed. Nature may be subtle, but nature is honest. These are not natural phenomena. So it's an unnatural phenomenon? Unnatural, that meaning that there may be a man-made factor involved. I don't think anything is going to convince you. Oh, no, I can be convinced, but I want to be convinced with facts. Absence of information doesn't mean that we have to dream up something. We should be able to say there's more to it than we know at the moment. But I do not, for a single second, buy the overheated concept of spontaneous human combustion. Well, the mind doesn't want to believe this, because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It defies common sense. It really does. And yet it happens. There's a great deal that can be discovered about processes in the human body and be discovered about energy in general by studying spontaneous human combustion and someday arriving at an understanding of how some people can literally bring themselves to end.